Welcome back to the FNZ 90 Plus Free podcast where free football supporters take a look into the dressing room, chat to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host, Ashley Simons. Where did we pick you up from today? Was it YouTube, Instagram? Why not follow us on Twitter? Join our community and get the best in content direct from your feed. And Twitter is, in fact, where the channel originally began, so I'm not going to lie, lads. If I was going to follow any of our pages, it would be Twitter. Tonight, I'm joined by Armchair and Tux. Armchair, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Yeah, sitting back, relaxed, ready for tonight. I'm relaxed. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. Bit of scoop, bit of a scoop. This one, so I'm I'm happy with this. Big scoop, yeah, definitely. We'll get another one on the notch for you. Uh, Tux, mate. Um, I'm going to ask you both this question real quick. But if you had to choose between Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville in terms of punditry, who would it be and why? Um, I think I'd probably just go with Gary Neville. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but I think I'd just go with him. Probably because I can understand him rather than Carragher. I can't really understand what he says. Um, so, yeah, probably probably Genev. Apologies to all the scouts out there. Um, Armchair, what are you going for, mate? I don't know. I think like, they, they come as a bit of a pair, don't they? I, wouldn't want, I don't think I'd want to split the bromance up. But I, Yeah, you wouldn't want one with, without the other, would you? Exactly. They do bounce off each other well. But um, I do think Gary Neville does have the one-liners in him, doesn't he? He does. He definitely does. So, boys, I'm, I'm dialing in tonight. I'm uh, not in my usual surroundings. Um, I'm at the missus's house. So, you know, hopefully this goes well. I don't get shouted at while I'm doing this. But tonight we're joined by a player who came through the ranks at Gillingham and went on to play for England, making 421 appearances, scoring 46 goals. West Ham once paid a fee of around 10.75 million for his services. It's Matt Jarvis. Matt, welcome to the show, mate. How are you doing tonight? Yes, good evening. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries, mate. Um, so let me just set the scene for you. Just imagine you're in a pub and you've had one too many beers and you, you see us three standing at the bar, but you need one of us to buy your pint. Just share one, you know, your best football stories and we'll go, go from there, right? Is that okay? Best football stories. Perfect. So just take it away, mate. Go for it. Okay, thanks, Ash. Uh, Matt, thanks again for coming on uh, tonight's episode. Um, I'm sure we'll cover a wide range of topics from your fabulous career, but I would like to start with your international call-up in 2011. Uh, So your debut came as a substitute against Ghana in a friendly at Wembley Stadium. Um, I mean, how can you sum up that moment playing or generally being involved within the England national side? I think for me, you know, like any kid's dream, yeah is play for your country and that was exactly the same for me um I was you know I suppose fortunate in the sense that my appearance was at Wembley in front of 85,000 fans uh, the Ghana fans were incredible as well made so much noise um and I got to have all of my friends and my family um there's so many like for instance Jill's Wolves West Ham fans that have they were all saying, oh, yeah, I was there at your debut. So I wasn't away some other country that no one was able to to get there. It was just, it is a dream come true. And, you know, to the feeling of, I, I just remember being, I was warming up like all the time, <laughs> you know, to looking back going, come on, like, just get, get me on, get me on, give me on. And I remember getting that call back and just sort of sprinting back to the dugout, um, you know, getting told all my bits and pieces what I had to do. And then I just remember standing on the touchline, waiting to come on. And then Jack Wiltshire's coming off. Uh, you know, I, I give him a high five and, and on I go. And I'm just thinking, I've done it. Like, no one can take this away from me now. I've played for my country. And then, and then as soon as you cross the line and the game's, you're, you're bang on to just football. But for that split second, I'm thinking, no, I've, I've, I've done my dream. Like, I've, I'm playing for my country. It's just absolutely incredible. Yeah, so... I think if I'm right in thinking, I think it was around that sort of time that Fabio Capello was in charge, sort of around 2011. Yeah, that's so correct, yeah. What was it like, obviously, working with him? I mean, he was in the driving seat at the time. So, I mean, what was it What was it like to work with a manager of that calibre? Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, at the time, look at the wide players that were there. You had Ashley Young, Stuart Downing, Aaron Lennon, Theo Wilcott, um, Milner. Uh, God, I mean, there's so many to, to, to choose from. Um, but... You know, I, I got called up. So, I mean, especially, as you said, from a manager that's established as 
as Capello was, was just incredible. Um, I remember my first, because the, the, just the game before I played for Wolves, um, we won 1-0 against Aston Villa and I scored the winner. And I remember I come and I arrived and Capello sort of saw me as I come in and he was like, uh, he just said, oh, are you happy to be called up? He didn't speak loads of English, and I was like, "Yeah, you know, come on!" I'm absolutely delighted to be called up. And he said, "Like, um, you know, that you were in my thoughts, but that goal sort of got you over the line." So I was like, "Oh, thank God I scored!" Yeah, it's uh, he was, yeah, he didn't like I say, he didn't speak loads of English, but he was very, it was strict. You know, it was um, very different to I suppose what I'd what I'd been used to, but it was very good, very organised. Like everyone. You had to wait till everyone was there to go in for dinner. You had to wait for everyone to finish before you could leave. It was, you know, all together, stay together, do everything as a team. So, you know, he had his really good, good uh, points. Yeah. So in terms of winning more caps, um, do you think you probably should have gone on to play more for the national side, uh, national side? Uh, especially with that left side having been a problem area for England in the past. And I know, obviously, you mentioned, you know, players like Ashley Young playing there as well. But do you think you probably could have played more? I would have liked to. Yeah, obviously, I would have loved to play more games. Um, I was in, I was in the preliminary squad for the for the Euros that summer, um, which obviously didn't didn't get in. But um, I, I do felt like I, I I played well. Obviously, I wasn't in a, a top six club, so to to be doing well at a team that was sort of, you know, just staying in the Premier League was uh, was going, going to be difficult. But I felt like I, I'd, I'd done enough um, and played well to, to get myself in with a chance. And, and obviously it just wasn't enough. Yeah. So I think if you grow up loving football, no matter who you support, I think every boy's dream would obviously, you know, to play for England or their, you know, the country they, they're born in. So... But let's rewind to where it all started for you. Um, as a child, I mean, did you go to many games or follow a specific team? Just sort of take me back to where your love of football came from. OK. Um, yeah, as a kid. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, 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 I was a, I grew up in Surrey, so I was a Man United fan. Um, <laughs> Um, I used to uh, I used to be like a, a young saint, so I um, so I used to go and watch all the Man United games down at Southampton. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, as a kid, I used to my like two sort of players, I suppose, that I used to love watching or sort of used to get the videos. Were were my first one was was Gary Lineker, would you believe? Um, just at the time, it was when he just scored. He was like forty eight goals for England. It were all of the hype and everything. I had the, had well the videos. Of, of all of that and he was playing for, for Spurs as well at the time and it was just I don't know it's something just sort of totally like caught my eye and that's why I, I like to I like to watch him um, but then it was always um, Ryan Giggs um, obviously I was playing in the same position I used to watch all of his he used to hate, like at the time he was like the, the pin-up player so he had all of the like skills videos he used to have all sorts of different videos out and I used to just watch him all the time um, and like obviously further on the line I was very delighted to be playing against him quite a few times but he he was my sort of guy that I, I looked up to growing up. Yeah so I read at the beginning of your career uh, you were obviously at Millwall as a boy uh, before going on to Gillingham a club where you made a name for yourself, obviously. Um, so talk me through some of the times you enjoyed during the time at Gillingham, in particular coming through the ranks at Priestfield and then obviously into the first team set up as you went along. Yeah, well, obviously, as I said, I, I was at Millwall for about six, seven years as a kid. And then, you know, to then at 15, sort of trying to get a youth team contract at the time, like a YTS at the time, getting told that you're not good enough and getting released was was very sort of difficult um hard to sort of sort of take you sort of question whether you want to do it or, or whether you want to continue to try and you know be a professional footballer really but I was lucky enough that I went on trial at Gillingham and if I'm honest I was I was pretty poor <laughs> on trial but I managed to get a youth team contract and then that for me just completely changed my mentality my confidence and I never looked back and in my um I'd played in the reserve team in my my first year at YTS, and then I, in my second year, in my youth team contract, I went on tour with the first team, and then I just stayed with them. I scored in pre-season with them, um, 
and at the time we had some amazing like experienced players in the dressing room and, and they sort of helped me along the way and it, it was it was amazing and I played when I was just 17 I played for the first team my debut was uh, against Sunderland at home it was like an evening kickoff and we were losing and it was like Julio Arca and Stuart Downing were on the left wing and that's the only time that I've sort of ever seen Nor Norsworthy have like a, a struggle in the game at that, at that time and I come on in that game and it was just sort of a real good eye opener and to right I need to this is the stage I need to sort of get on with it and get up to the pace of the game because obviously it's, it's totally different to reserve team football Yeah so you're obviously there at Gillingham, uh, Gillingham for quite a while um, what were those sort of memories like for you what can you sort of cast your mind back to during your time there I absolutely loved it it was sort of where I sort of started as you say made my name um, the fans were absolutely amazing um, they used to sing all the time. Every time I you know, got the ball, they would be up off their seat expecting me to take someone on, cut inside and shoot into the top corner. It was just, it was a really, like when you're 17, 18, you're, you've got no fear. You just go for it. And that's that was my whole mentality at the time. And I absolutely loved it. I still, I've been back quite a few times now. It's just, it's a really nice club. The fans, I said, were, they were brilliant to me. And and that's where I really sort of learned my trade, um, got myself in the picture, I suppose, and um, and kicked on. I just uh, it was you know to to be able to play week in week out in a in a in a team like when I first got, when I was seventeen they were in the championship, so it was it was a huge deal. Um, and then obviously got relegated on the last game of the season, which was at the time very hard to take because on the coach journey home a lot of the older players or the players that you know felt that they should be playing the championship were all like well I'm gone I'm gone I'm gone so I was sat on the coach like everyone's not going to be here next season so you have to rebuild and do that but that that helped my game hugely and I was then like uh, ready to to continue to play at the highest level so Matt I wanted to concentrate on your time at Wolves club he spent five good seasons there and uh, making over 175 appearances for the club most of which were in the Premier League now take me back to how it all began with Wolves you turned down a contract at Gillingham to join the then championship side managed by none other than Mick McCarthy how did the move come about and where were there any other clubs sniffing about at the time um okay so yeah I um my contract was up at Gillingham um I I felt like I wanted to to play at the, the highest level I possibly could and and I had a quite a few clubs that were interested um, I remember I was actually going on a boys holiday would you believe um, I had my bags packed I was just about to go in the taxi to the airport and then I get a call from my agent to say right tomorrow you're going to Portugal to meet Mick McCarthy and I was like what I can't like, I'm, I'm and I was like right I started spoke to my mates right, I can't go um, I'll have to reschedule I've got to go and see Mick McCarthy so I, I flew out to Portugal um, met him in like a hotel, sitting, had some lunch. And as soon as I sat down with him, there was only one place I was going. He was, you know, he's, he's very to the point. He's, he, he doesn't mess around. He, he, tell, he told me exactly what he wanted and what he wanted from me. Um, and then I, I obviously spoke to him about different parts and, bits and different pieces of what he was looking for. But I was sold there and then. Um, and then I... I flew back, went straight to Molyneux, got shown around the facilities, everything. And then it was just a matter of uh, sorting everything out, which was really quick. And then I, funny enough, signed uh, and I actually signed on at the stadium with the club secretary, who then took me to the airport and was on the same flight as me out to Marbella, where I met my mates. <laughs> <laughs> Quality. So whoever done the logistics on that definitely got a pay rise that weekend. Um, Mick McCarthy, like you said there, he managed some huge clubs along the way. Um, one to never shy away from controversy at all. You, you delved into it there, but what was he really like as a manager? I mean, the players always seem to play for him. He's the, I have to say, probably he's the best manager I've worked for. Um, just just everything about him, he's, he's honest. He's on the pitch every single minute of the day. Um, like I said, there's no messing around. If you, you on a Friday morning, if you were 
uh, you, you'd see TC, his assistant, come round and you'd get the curly finger and you'd go up to his office and you'd be like, oh, no. And he, he would be like, Jarvo, um, you're not playing tomorrow. I'm putting you on the bench. And you'd be like, why well, I did this? And he would say, right, this is the reason. And I'd say, well, I think this. And he goes, no, I, I completely understand, but this is the reason why I'm doing it. And you just got to accept it. And he was completely honest. It was just, it was really... The, the, he had that authority as well that um, you know he when he walked into a room everyone knew about it he had that aura about him and you couldn't you know everything about it was he gelled a group of lads together that all pushed in the right direction he didn't like any bad eggs you know it was it was it was a pleasure to work with and and everyone as you said I don't think anyone's got a bad word to say about him he was he was that that great that great manager and that's how us as a team yeah. we were so like you say you did have some successful times there in your first season with club you missed out on the playoffs marginally on goal difference however your second season with Wolves yeah. you finished top of the league and gained promotion to the Premier League you played with the likes of Silva and Evans Blake and Jody Craddock who previously joined us on the podcast um, you featured yourself 28 times in the league that season have you any fond memories of that year and that team? I would, uh, it's probably you know, obviously there's there's loads of other bits and pieces, but that season, winning the league and the style and the performances that we did, I thought that, that's probably the most enjoyable season of football that I've had. You know, obviously winning games and winning trophies and winning the league is is uh, is enjoyable. So that that group of lads, that team was just amazing to to be in. You know, I said I think everyone apart from probably Jody, everyone hadn't played in the Premier League that we were all driving to to establish ourselves to to get promoted and it was just a pleasure to to be there, you know, working day in, day out uh, with them. Um, you know, we we were all close knit group because a lot of us were sort of similar ages as well. So we all used to go out together. You know, it was like, you know, one big happy family, I suppose. We were all out together doing everything together. Um had a great team bonding uh, and that was down to the manager and, and the way he, he, him and his staff, because everyone wanted to work hard. Everyone wanted to do extras. And, and it's, it is, like I said, it's probably the most enjoyable year of my or football like season. And we all sp- still speak now. That's the thing. You, you, it's very difficult to, to keep in touch with a lot of players that you play in a team with, but I'd say that particular squad, I'd say we're all still friends. We all still speak. So it, it speaks volumes. Yeah, definitely. So moving on to your Premier League um, debut, ironically it was against West Ham and what was the follow of three testing years in the Premier League with Wolves. However, you established yourself as a winger in the top division. You were without a doubt one of those players that caused issues at the back for any top side. I'm sure that was the reason you got an England call up. Um, I know you delved into it a little earlier, but how did the, you know, experiences with the squad, you know, affect your playing career would you say did you learn anything whilst you were with England yeah I think like the the biggest sort of thing before I went to England obviously you know I was playing really well scoring goals um, obviously playing in the Premier League but no one I suppose had not sussed me out or anything but sort of they weren't really paying attention I suppose and, and when you get that recognition when you go and play for England then people start to pay attention and look and make sure that they know what you're going to do. And I remember that was the first thing that Mick McCarthy said when I come back, you know, he was just like, it wasn't like, oh, congratulations, blah, blah. He was like, right, now you need to improve more because everyone's going to be like, right, this is their cup final against you, making stop you because you're in England international. And then I had to adapt my game. I had to, you know, work on it even more because once you, you get classed as, as being in England international, you, 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 you draw other people on you. you it's harder for you to create space for yourself it's it, it, I suppose it brings more problems but it's something that you have to do and you have to develop your game and that's that's the biggest thing that I learned from from being away with the lads because they were again a, a fantastic group of players you look at all, the only player that essentially wasn't there at that time was uh, was Gerard and he was injured at the time everyone else was there you know Rooney Lampard Terry Ashley Cole these players were just incredible players and to, to train with them you're always going to be learning yeah absolutely I mean despite making an England appearance obviously and your impressive performances in the league Wolves were relegated in May 2011 you picked up um, both the fans and players player of the year awards that season um, 
that summer you knew in the back of the mind you were probably a Premier League player, would you say? And did you have offers on the table at that point? Yeah, I mean, the last uh, Mick McCarthy got the sack, I think it was with 13 games to go um, or 12 games to go. I, I think it was 30, I can't remember. But I, I scored I scored seven goals in 12 or 13 games the last se- last bit of the season. And for anyone in that league, I, I you know, I thought as a wide player in a struggling team that was getting that was relegated, that's not that's just pretty good going. Um, and I felt that I'd obviously just got in the England squad, uh, was playing really well. Uh, and you know, I needed to stay in the Premier League to to continue to to perform at the highest level. And obviously, I I knew that there was going to be um, interest. It's just um, it's very difficult when you're in that situation. You know, I had a contract at the club, and obviously, I'd absolutely it was you know the best period of my life as a as a professional. You know, being successful, enjoying it, amazing group of lads. Um, so it, it was a very difficult um, to time to sort of question what I needed to do. So in August 2012, Wolves accepted bid from West Ham, which has been reported for an initial £7.5 million, rising, as Ash mentioned earlier, for, to £10.75 million for your services. And, you know, even nowadays... That eight years on, that, that is a lot of money still for a player. Um, you signed on a five-year contract with an option to an additional year. At the time, it was a transfer record for West Ham. Um, it must have been a good feeling to, you know, they've gone out, they've put a lot of money down on the table for for your services. How, how did that make you feel? Yeah, obviously, it was uh, at the time. It was uh, it was huge. I mean, to you know, to be anyone sort of club record signing is is amazing, but it comes with a, a you know a huge amount of pressure. Um, and as you said, like the fee was, I think it in rose to the end was like twelve point seven five in the end. So it was like a, at the time was a was a was a big big fee. So um, as I said, it came with a lot of pressure, but it was. I remember signing, going down, signing, and then just sort of. I obviously I knew how big the club was, but when you actually sign and then you're the, the record signing and you're in London and it, it's just heightened so much. They were, it's such a huge club and everyone's a West Ham fan. You know, it's just every, yeah, you know, you're walking down, oh, I'm a massive West Ham fan. Oh, you just, everyone's a West Ham fan when you're in London. So it was, it was a massive, I suppose, eye opener a little bit into the sense that, you know, I knew it was a big club, but it was, it was huge. And it was just amazing to get out and start playing and meet the, meet the lads and, and to then play Upton Park. Yeah, so you mentioned the pressure pre- pressure there. Are you a, a, the sort of player to thrive on the pressure or did did or did you really kind of take it quite quite hardly? Uh, I, I like to think that I, I thrive off pressure. I think, you know, my last the the season my last season at Wolves and the first season at West Ham, I put in the most crosses in Europe. And the most successful crosses in Europe, so I can't have been doing too bad as a as a wide player to um, to, to be able to do that and to not say that I, I had a good good start to, well, a, a, you know, obviously a good season at Wolves and a good start to my West Ham career with the pressure of being, you know, the the uh, club record signing. So I'd like to say that I, I thrived off the pressure. Yeah, you've just picked up on my next next question, actually, um, <laughs> being. So you attempted 171 crosses that season, successful in 42 of them, um, which was also, as you mentioned, highest in Europe and the Premier League. Does that stat kind of sum you up as a player? You you know, trying to get past your man, get a good quality ball in the box for your centre forward to finish off? Yeah, I think I think it sort of I, it adapted a little bit because I would say if you asked any Jules fans, they would say that it wasn't... a so much about running down line putting crosses it was running down line cutting inside and shooting um, and then I sort of did a little bit of both I suppose at Wolves um, well, I guess as you move up the leagues it's you have less space you have less time maybe yeah. especially with West Ham um, being in the Premier League you might not have the opportunity every time to get your shot off yeah and again you know being not 
so obviously, but we were, you know, Wolves, we were, you know, struggling every season to stay in the Premier League. So you're not going to get as many chances to, to score goals. Um, and the same with West Ham, they've just been promoted back to the Premier League. So in the first season, it's, it's always going to be difficult, although we finished 10th. Um, so I, th- I, I suppose, yeah, I, I sort of adapted a little bit. And, and again, at West Ham, you know, I... Uh, my role in the team was to do that because we signed a centre forward on loan who had the most, uh, he had the record for the most um, contacts at heading. So it was just even like a, the perfect combination. I put the most successful crosses and he headed the most headers from across. So it was like, it, this should have been an amazing uh, partnership. Yeah. And you've all, you also mentioned that you, at the time West Ham were at Upton Park. There's been a lot said over the last few years about West Ham's move to the Olympic Stadium. How good was it to play at Upton Park and the atmosphere and you know the fans being so close to the pitch? Yeah, I think I've experienced both um, as an away player and as a home player. Um, and then as an away player, I remember I was at Wolves the season before. Uh, it was a massive game because they were struggling relegation. We were struggling with relegation. And at Wolves, we won 3-1 and I scored as well. And the the crowd sort of once we sort of got ourselves in front they they turned a little bit and it it was one of them places that you were like as an away player you're like right get the fans on their back and then then we can you know we can get on top uh, as a home player if you got the fans on top and you were doing well it was just the most amazing atmosphere you know no team wanted to play there you know that's why you've got so many good results at Upson Park it was one of them places that the fans were so close to you you could hear, you could feel them. And I obviously took all the set pieces as well in all corners. So you're literally in with the fans trying to take them. So it, it was a special place. I think that's why you know, a lot of the fans didn't like the move because you're so far away in the Olympic Stadium. But I mean, it, it, it's some arena, but I, I understand that you know, the atmosphere is not quite the same. Yeah. And um, I mean, you, you had some great, great times at, at West Ham. What 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 is your kind of stick out standout memory for you there? I think as a as a player and you know from a yeah, from a club and a fan's perspective, I think scoring away at White Hart Lane in the quarter final, um, scoring the week equaliser and then going on uh, Modibo Maiga uh, scoring the winner, it was just such an amazing um, well feeling I think that the, you know, we scored we were right next to the away fans they were going absolutely berserk uh, obviously being a huge derby game um, it was just something that yeah, everyone always remembers and brings up and you know for, for me it's, it's something that I'll, I'll always remember so I'd say that one sticks in my mind yeah and uh, but 2015 you joined Norwich City on a season long loan Scoring your first goal for them only 11 days after signing. It must have felt good, you know, to hit, hit the ground running at, at Norwich and, and you know, just, just to carry on, really. Yeah, I mean, uh, Slavon Bilic had just come in at, at West Ham um, and I'd spoke to him a lot because I didn't feature as much as I wanted the season before with last um, year of Sam Allardyce and I didn't want to have another season where I didn't play. I found it difficult to to just sort of not play or sit on the bench all year. So I wanted to play and, and front, I actually played in every single game at the start of the Premier League season under Savan Bilic. I played like last 30 minutes, last 25, last 20, 30 minutes. And he was like, he wanted me to stay, but he couldn't guarantee that I would play games. So I, I got literally last like hour of the deadline, I would get a call from Norwich to say, to go there on loan. Um, and I just decided that that would be best for me, footballing-wise. Uh, so I went and my first game, I scored on my debut. It was just the best feeling, um, you know, after not playing as much as I wanted to then go out and sort of prove myself again, I suppose. Uh, and, and scoring on my debut, playing really well. You couldn't have asked for, for a, a better start, at, especially at home as well at Cow Road. Yeah, so you, you joined Norwich City that December... Um, permanently for a ported 2.5 million. However, Yaya Torres, uh, Danny Dirty with a knee injury, um, which then is kind of led on to 
other injuries, which, you know, you do tend to see in football, um, in your hamstring and hip. How, how was that period for you? Uh, yeah, it was, well, it, it was the most difficult time of my whole football and I would say my life, really. Um, you know, I, I'd done my deep fibre MCL in tackling Yaya Toure. Uh, on the scan, it just it said a deep fibre MCL, so I rehabbed it, got myself back, played for the rest of the season. Uh, but it wasn't right. It was so sore all the time. Um, I had all these injections through the summer. Come back pre-season, it was still in bits. So I was like, I can't do it anymore. I had the operation and they found on the operation they actually wasn't attached properly. So that's obviously why it was so sore. So I had the operation, got myself back fit uh, in the correct time. First training session, cut back inside, went to shoot and uh, someone come out and smashed me and my ankle bent right back. And I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine because I've been out for so long. I had such a, and like, just wanted to get back and play. Had a scan. They said I was just swelling. Um, so fine. Had an injection to settle it down. It didn't settle down. Um, and then at the time, Manager just got sacked. It was a bit of up and down with with the team, and I, I didn't really get like going because my ankle was so sore. So then it sort of fizzled out a little bit. I played a couple of twenty threes games that my ankle was still killing me. I had more injections all over the summer. Come back pre season, wasn't right again, and I, I couldn't carry on. Uh, had uh, just a, like a scope to see what was going on in my ankle, and they realised that. So on the scan, when your cartilage is sort of like that. Uh, and then as soon as they touched it, when they went in, it all fell off. So I had to have a micro fracture of my ankle, um, which you know, I was going into the operation thinking I'm going to be out for four weeks. It ended up being eight months. And that was just absolutely demoralizing. Um, I, obviously, I, I, I just had my son, my first child, and uh, I was living up in Norwich on my own, really. My wife was back home and you know, with with my son and sort of trying to, you know, sort that out while I was trying to get myself fit. So I was away from everything, yeah, you know, finding it very difficult and trying everything because a lot of people don't understand, like when you're injured, you're in more than the fit players. So you're, you're in early, you finish late, you only have like maybe one day off, whereas all the other lads have a day off during the week or, and, or and after the game. So you're in constant and you, you, you know, you, you don't get a set routine. It's not like, right, you're going to have a Sunday off every week. It's like, oh, are you finishing at four, half four, five o'clock and they go, oh, um, you, you have tomorrow off and then you're back in the next day and you're like, well, you know, I'm two and a half hours away from going home. If I would have known, I would have packed and ready to go. And so, it, yeah, it was, it was difficult. And obviously uh, once I was got back from starting to get back from my ankle, I picked up IT band friction syndrome because all my operations were on my right hand side. So my body was compensating and I, I just, so I had to have that cleaned up as well. Uh, and to get, you know, to, to basically every day to be fighting, to get myself back fit and then something else go was, was really, really difficult. Um, and yeah, there was, there was times I used to go home on my own and, and be in bits, but, you know, at the back, you know, I was getting told by a specialist on my ankle there was nothing that they could do. You know, that was it. And I, I couldn't walk. I was in pain walking. I couldn't even walk downhill. It was that bad. But not once while I was like, no, that's it. I, I was so determined to, to get myself through it. And it was a long, long, long road. But I finally got myself back fit. And, you know, I would have loved to have played in the team with Daniel Farker as manager because the way he plays is is perfect for me. And I spoke to him about it. He was he was the same. He was like, you know, he was desperate for me to get back fit and to be involved in, in his team. But it just at the time I got myself back fit, it got to January, the team were flying. Um, everyone was fit. And he was like, look, you know, I can't really, you know, I can't take this lad out because he's playing really well with, you know, top of the league what can we do? So he just said, look, if I'm as a, as a manager, I want you to stay because you're, you know, I want you around the place. You've had, you've got the experience. I want you to keep you. But as a, as a person, I th you need to go out and play games. And as soon as he said that I was, you know, he's spot on. I needed to go and play some games. So that's why I went on loan and, and, and got some games under my belt at Walsall. Yeah. And I mean, you've done incredibly well, really to, you know, a lot of people would have given up 
and and you battled through that and you 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 know had setback after setback bit a bit of a vicious circle really one uh, one injury leading to another um but as you said you then went on on to Warsaw got some games under your belt how how was it to be back playing again it was amazing it's just like you know being you know, it's just going back to being a kid you're going out doing what you love to do i remember it was my first uh, my first game back we played bolton in a cup and after about 10 minutes i'd already got my first assist it was just you know it was amazing to just go out and feel and then i got a second assist in the game although we lost the game in the end it was it was just so nice to be back out on the stage and and playing games and and being pain free and and being you know playing with the lads and getting that buzz of being in the change room and going out and making an assist and it's just having the fans out there it was just there's nothing like it so that's why that's why you work so hard to to get yourself back and play and then it was it was brilliant following on from that end of last season you were released by Norwich and February this year you joined Woking how did how did that that move come about for you was it just you know was an offer on a table just to go and train and then you eventually signed what how did that that work well, I'd um, I'd been it's, it's it's yeah strange really. I, I'd I'd had a couple of clubs that I, I I was going to, and I went back to to Gillingham to train for a bit, and they were all like, "Yes, we definitely want you." And then I just everything went quiet. I couldn't get hold of anyone, and which was a shame. And then I was at Swindon, where they were the same, saying they wanted to sign me. They just had to wait until players would go back out on loan and coming back in and then I'd done sort of six, seven weeks of travelling miles <laughs> to Swindon and then the day I was supposed to sign it all fell through. Um so I, I in the sense I was I was fully fit and trained for the last two, three months, but I still didn't sign at a club because I'd had things that I thought were going to happen. And then I got a call, I remember I was up in up uh, doing a workout and um, I get a call from a number I didn't know so I answered it and it was like oh hi Matt it's, it's Martin Tyler and I was like yep yeah, recognise the voice yeah that's, I was like and I was thinking oh what's it you know because at the time I've been doing a bit of media stuff I was thinking oh brilliant like he's going to get me to go to Sky Sports to do some sort of you know something along their lines and he goes oh I don't know if you um, you know but I'm actually the assistant manager at Woking and I was like I was like what? <laughs> Um, and he just was like, look, you know, obviously I know you've got other things on the table, but you know, you're a local lad. You know, we'd love for you to come down and just get some game you know, like fitness going. And they had a game, I think it was about two days later. They were like, look, just come down, play a game and just sort of, you know, get your fitness going, your match fitness. And I was like, OK, yeah, it's, it is only, you know, it's not far. I'm, I'm local. So I was like, do you know what? I'll do it. I went down. I played in the game, uh, which was great. And then they were like, right, you know, would you, would you want to consider coming and signing? We'd love to have you. And, and then I spoke to the manager who was, who's brilliant. Alan Dawson is brilliant. And you know, I, I played literally as a, as a kid next door to the stadium. I was at Guildford city boys. I was in at Meadow sports, which is literally backs onto the stadium. So um, they were showing me around all of that. And I was like, look, you don't need to do that. I, I you know, I love, loved coming and playing and, and I, you know, I, I would love to come and join. So that's how it was. It wasn't about any sort of a financial thing because, you know, that's not, it's not happening in non league, but um, it was just for me, it was just perfect. I, I was, you know, enjoyable fit and wanted to play there and, and they are great people and it's a great club. So it was, it was just perfect for me to, to go and do that. And then obviously started absolutely amazing. I've come on, about 10 seconds later, or yeah, about a minute later, I, I'd got my first goal. Uh, they then won the game. And then my second game was my daughter had been born the day before. Um, and then I went there and again, come off the bench and, and got uh, another assist. And then my season was done again. <laughs> it just summed me up the last sort of couple of, couple of years. It just, just didn't go for me. So at this moment in time, are you officially retired, or what's what's kind of next for you? There's no way I'm retired. No, so I will be back playing next season for sure. Anyone in mind? Anything lined up? Give us an exclusive. Well, I, I can't give you an exclusive, but it'll be very, very soon. Yeah. Nice, no, good to hear. And um, I, 
any plans moving forward into retirement? Are we going to see you pop up as a coach somewhere? Is that is that in the back of your head? Um, I've got a few ideas. Um, I've been doing my badges anyway because that's sort of always one of them things that when you get the opportunity to do them, I think it's it's very worthwhile to do it. Um, so that that is a possibility. As I said, I've I've been doing a bit of media work while I was sort of not had a club, and and I've I've really enjoyed it, and that would be something that I would like to continue to do. So um, yeah, there's there's a couple of options that I, I would like to to continue, but. I feel like I've missed a you know a couple of couple few years of, of playing and that's sort of in the tank as it were in my legs and so I've still got I've still got the pace I've still got the energy to run around and I want to continue to play it as long as I possibly can because you know for me it's something I've loved I've done it for 16 years already 17 years however long it is and as I said if I if I feel like I can do it my body says I can do it and uh, and my wife lets me do it <laughs> then. Uh, then I'm carrying on. Yeah, well, that's definitely hear. the most important thing, isn't it? At the end of the day, the missus has got to be happy. Matt, yeah, are you well, surprised? Right. Go on. What were you going to say? So I was going. To, I was going to say now. My son's three and a half. He's absolutely buzzing. Like he, he's. I've never pushed him into football, but now he's like wanted to do it. And he's like, oh, yeah. I said, oh, do you want to you know, next season? Do you want to come and watch Daddy play? He's like. No, Daddy, I want to play with you, with you on the pitch. I was like, well, okay, maybe we can do that one afterwards. But it would be great for you know to be able to take him to games and and for him to actually see me play. Or he might not remember it, but it will still be um, still be nice. Matt, we're getting to the end of the show tonight, but I just want to ask you a quick question: Are you surprised to see how well Wolves have done over the you know the last few years, given the right investment? Um, I think I think I would say yes, but um, you know when you when you start looking at the squad that they sort of gathered together, especially after they won promotion. I mean the the, the players that they're bringing in, obviously the investment's been amazing. The club was already set; like the stadium was brilliant, the training ground was brilliant, so that sort of didn't need the investment. But the the players that they brought in and the style of play, it's just the manager is fantastic, um, and you can see by. The way they play, the way the group of lads, they're all together. Yeah, everyone's behind the manager, and you can see that. And they're only going from strength to strength. I've watched them many times this season, and especially since they've come back as well. And they just look like a, a proper Champions League side, don't they? Um, you know, they, they they've got incredible players. And I don't, you know, there's lots of reports of P players moving from there. But at the minute, why would you want to do that there? They're they're on the up. They're they're going to be you know potentially in Champions League football. If not, they're going to be in Europa League, and and the club's only going one way. Yeah, they're definitely knocking on the door. Completely agree. Right, the final question tonight, mate. And uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see any of our previous footage, but we always ask, the, you know, this one question. We're trying to get this player on the channel. Do you know Deli Adebola? Unfortunately for you, I, I don't. I don't have uh, enough to to be able to get him on the pod for you. I'm afraid. No, <laughs> that is terrible news. Demar. But Demar. Tux is on recruitment, as you know. He's you know coerced you into coming on here tonight. Um, I feel he's getting a le- lot closer. The smile on his face is getting getting wider by the week, mate. Um, I don't want you to tell us, but just give us you know the the face of somebody who. Um, who's, you know, going to get this guy on the pod soon. You're going to have to say a word or something to get the camera on your face. Um, I, would, I, would give, I would give some information away, um, but I'm not going to just yet. Ooh, devious, cliffhanger. devious cliffhanger. Well, we're going to have to wait until next week. Matt, it's been incredible having you on tonight, mate. Obviously, you've had a you know, fantastic career. And although it's cut short by injury in places... You know, we're looking forward to seeing you back out there again, mate. So good luck and all the best for the future, all right? Thank you very much. Cheers, Take Matt. care, mate. Cheers, Matt. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Cheers.